I'm really excited for today's call. It's going to be really fun. So today's Let's Talk is on mindfulness and resiliency during times of loneliness with Pandit Dasa. I've been so excited for this talk for a while because I feel like it's so important um, to talk about mindfulness, especially today. There's a lot of stressors that a lot of us are facing. And mindfulness, I think, is a really powerful tool. And I'm a firm believer that it can change your life. I know for me, I need to work on it, but when I do practice my mindfulness and my meditation, the world just seems to brighten up. So today's Let's Talk is on mindfulness and resiliency during times of loneliness with Pandit Dasa. This is a really suitable conversation after our talk with Janelle Peters last month, dealing with burnout. From longer work hours to increased demands at home, all of these stressors. It's easy to feel overwhelmed and stressed in today's hectic and ever-changing world. Loneliness and social isolation are among the most powerful risk factors for poor health and accelerated mortality, everything from depression, heart disease, et cetera. Yet mitigating these social risk factors can be a challenge for many of us. There are a few interventions from drugs on down to massage therapy, et cetera, acupuncture that have been shown to effect effectively reduce loneliness and increase social contact. However, the most powerful has really been mindfulness interventions, which train skills in monitoring your present moment experiences. And that's a lot of the reasons why I asked the questions that I recently asked. Part of those questions are really asking you, are you in the present moment? Or are you constantly thinking about the past, the future? Are you focusing on worry? Being present is really about centering yourself. And that's why I'm so excited to have Pandit talk about mindfulness today as he discusses his experience as well, being a monk for over a decade. A lot of times we don't think about how we're feeling and our emotions. And I think this conversation is going to be really helpful because the more you're able to really be in touch and in tune with your emotions, it's much easier to then live a purposeful life. I'm so excited to introduce our guest for today, Pandit Dasa. He is a mindfulness leadership expert, a motivational keynote speaker. He just spoke to 2000 attendees of a conference in LA today, and he's also an author. He has spoken on mindfulness leadership and conducted workshops at Google, JP Morgan Chase, Citibank, State Farm, Bank of America, UNICEF, Harvard, Columbia, and the list goes on. He also has presented on the big stage at notable conferences such as the World Government Summit in Dubai, the National Shroom Convention, Oracle HCM Conference, LEAD 2017, and the Work Human Conference. He has helped individuals develop positive leadership qualities, lower stress and anxiety, and increase focus and productivity while boosting emotional intelligence. In addition to his numerous speaking engagements, he has spoken at TEDx conference and been featured in the Wall Street Journal, PBS, NPR, the New York Times, Psychology Today, and writes for Huffington Post. In his book, Urban Monk, Pandit writes about the turning point in his life after his family lost their multi-million dollar business, which ultimately led him to live as a monk for 15 years in New York City. Drum roll, please welcome Pandit Dasa. Hello, Pandit. So first question I have for you. In your book, Urban Monk, you write about your experience living as a monk for 15 years in New York City. And I cannot think of a more difficult place to be centered and be a monk than in New York City. I live in New York as well, and that's not an insult to my city, but it's pretty much the opposite of peace and calm. How and why did you decide to live a life as a monk? So, Plan, thank you very much for having me. I'm very happy to be here and speak on this very important topic at this time. And, uh, you know, how I became a monk, and of course, I'm not a monk anymore, but it's, it was a long journey. It started off, like, my parents moved to the U.S. in 1980 from India. They came over with little to no money. They came over with very simple, just hoping to have economic freedom, which is why most people come to the U.S. 
one of the first things they did was they set up a small shop on Venice Beach, California, the boardwalk. So they were selling just gift items there. I was seven years old. I was just running around the beach, learning about pizza and the music and the beach, basketball, all of these things. And my parents were working seven days a week. And and within a matter of about seven to eight years, they established a multi-million dollar jewelry business. And we began living that American dream much faster than we expected. And it's not just hard work because a lot of people work hard. Hard work and luck sometimes are both combined bring about success, right? And everything was great. We're living in a house on top of the hills of Los Angeles, a pool, jacuzzi, literally everything that you can imagine. And then in the early 1990s, my parents' jewelry factory caught on fire and it burnt down and we ended up losing everything. Went almost completely broke. And at that time, my dad trying to decide what to do next, decides to explore new business opportunities in post-communist Bulgaria. Bulgaria was just coming out of communism. So we pack up our bags, leave LA behind for good and move to Bulgaria, a country where no one speaks English because it just wasn't spoken. And everything on TV is either in the local language or in Russian, couldn't watch TV. Everything in the movie theaters was about five years old because I don't think they had American movies allowed during the communist time. And there was no basketball courts, volleyball courts. I just didn't have anything to do. So then I began an inward journey when my external sort of distractions came to a complete halt. I began an inward journey. And that's where I started to practice mindfulness during a time of loneliness and confusion and this financial upheaval that we went through and this uprooting of where we were growing up in LA. And now all of a sudden we're in Bulgaria. I just couldn't imagine the difference. And there was no internet either at that time. So you can imagine, I just literally had nothing to do. And so mindfulness really helped me stay sane because I was asking myself the question. And I think a question that a lot of us ask ourselves is why is this happening to me? And what did I do to deserve this? And why is this, when is this going to be over? And I asked myself that when we were in Bulgaria, because it was, uh, it was a chaos for me, what was happening. And then we spent two years in Bulgaria, moved back to the U S to the East coast to New Jersey. So my parents could have a little shop in Manhattan. I helped them with that a little And then in 1999, I was just really frustrated with life. I'm like, I just need to figure out what I want to do here. We've moved so much. I've been uprooted multiple times in the last eight years. So I decided to go to a monastery in Mumbai, India, just to understand myself a little better, understand my purpose a little better. And so here I am living in Mumbai with 40 monks. Everyone sleeps on a hardwood floor. No one has mattresses. No one has a bed. No one has their own room. It's communal living. Three big rooms. Everybody sleeps there. Can I pause you for a second? Because you just said, I just decided to go to Mumbai. (laughs) Most people just don't wake up and think, okay, I need to go to a monastery. (laughs) Something must have sparked you to get you there. So I, there is a, I can fill in the gaps for hours on each thing that I'm talking about, but I did, I had met some monks in the New York and New Jersey area and began talking with them just because in my life had been turbulent that I was looking for some more clarity, like why are all these things happening to me? And one of them said, why don't you, this is a really nice monastery in India. Why don't you go check it out and just see what you think, see what you, not that you're going to become a monk, but just go spend some time there and clear your head. And it's, it's a treat it like a retreat. So that's why I went there and we were waking up at four in the morning, meditating for hours a day. The rest of the day was spent serving one another, serving the community. It was a life of simplicity, humility, and service. That's what we were doing. I fell in love with that lifestyle and decided to spend six months in India. So from one month to six months in a few different monasteries in India, moved, came back to the U.S., moved into a monastery on the Lower East Side where I thought I'd spend maybe a few more months and then go back and live life the way everyone else does. Ended up spending 15 years living as a monk in New York. And then about eight years ago, eight, eight and a half years ago, I decided to leave the monastic life so I can speak in corporations on the topic of mindfulness. Because when I was in the monastery, I was speaking on college campuses in New York and around the country on similar topics. And then I started getting invitations to speak in companies and then I decided to transition myself out of monastic life to so do that. So can I pause for a second and just like rewinding back to your experience at the monastery? What were the key learnings that you received or the key takeaways you learned from that experience being in the monastery and living the life of a monk in Mumbai? 
Yeah, one of the biggest things was that everything, really deeply understanding that everything in life is temporary, right? There is no real permanence. So better not to get too attached to anything. Don't get too attached to the happiness and don't get too attached to the sadness. <laughs> everything comes and goes. This world, there was nothing permanent created in this material world. And so that was one major thing. And of course, the other thing was when I, I would do a lot of introspection and realize that everything that happened in my life helped me grow, mature, and become wiser and allowed me to do what I'm doing right now. There's a nice quote from Steve Jobs in which he says, you can't connect the dots looking forward. You can only connect the dots when you look back at your life. So I chose then to look back and see how each difficult and painful moment has helped me grow instead of just being haunted by that, but seeing that was actually a stepping stone. That difficulty was a stepping stone and it's brought me to where I am today. And so that's what I also encourage people. Like if there's been something difficult in your life, take it, analyze it, dissect it, and pull out the valuable lessons that difficulty taught us because it's helped us come to where we're at right now. So those were yeah. some, but there's others also. No, that's a really powerful lesson. And so as a monk, you had to meditate for hours and hours. And I know in some monasteries, you only eat once a day or before noon and you know there's other kind of and you have to let go of all material possessions how difficult was that to kind of transition and do that because you, you basically come from a life where you were in a family that were multimillionaires. you have the pool you have the luxury cars you have all this the big house and then you go to this life where you might your possession is a mat <laughs> right you eat a simple meal what is given to you that must have been difficult. How did you transition from that to this very simple life? See, for me, the transition wasn't that difficult because life had already beaten me down so much that a life of simplicity was actually quite exhilarating. Well, I remember one of the monks that I had met during my time said that the more you have, the more you have to lose. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I was like, oh my gosh. And the more you have, the more anxiety you actually have. That's what it means to have more. It means to have more anxiety. So when I didn't have all of that, I actually was peaceful. Like I didn't have money. I didn't, we had, we ate nicely. We ate our own, we cooked our own meals. We had two to three meals a day. So that wasn't tough, but I felt relieved. I felt more happy in the time, my time in the monastery than the happiness that I experienced being multimillionaires, just because there was very little anxiety. And my whole time was dedicated to practicing and teaching others. So I was actually making a difference in other people's lives. Whereas before I wasn't really doing that. That's amazing. I was having a conversation with a friend the other day and we we're talking about how our society pushes people to want more and more. It's capitalism is based on wanting you to feel bad so that you want more, right? Because if everyone was content, if everyone was happy with themselves, they wouldn't want the creams, they wouldn't want the clothes, they wouldn't have the cars. And we started debating about money. And I was like, some of the poorest people I know have the most money because they're so afraid of holding on to the money or they're afraid of losing it. And how is that wealthy? How is that living in abundance? And everything is in the mind and it's about mindset because there's people who might have a lot of zeros in their bank accounts, but they're always feeling or wanting more. And what I think what a lot of what you're talking about is perspective, right? What going back to now, you go back, you go to New York, you're, you're living this life as a monk, and then you decide to leave the monastic life. What was that spark? You mentioned that you wanted to go from teaching in the schools to now in the corporations what was that spark that said okay I, i'm done with this part of my life now i'm ready to leave leave it what what was that spark and why it's hard to say why i think at a certain point i'd been doing that for 10 or 12 years and then at a certain point you just want to bring up about greater challenges in your life so i was like i've helped so many college students and i want to help the corporate environment. And that would be a greater challenge for me because people in the corporate world, they have kids and they have finances and so many more responsibilities. And not that students don't, but they're more limited to the responsibilities they have. And so I knew that I would be able to address the concerns of somebody in corporate America with family and with dozens of responsibilities and dozens of bills. So it was just something 
there was a certain feeling that I experienced when I was before moving into a monastery, just like a pull. Now there was a similar kind of pull. It was similar, but different that pulled me out and wanting to do something different. And it wasn't that different. It was still very, it was just to a different group of people. And so I just knew that I wanted to speak to people who had accomplished more in their life and whose lives are perhaps more stressful, more complicated, more involved. And so those were some of the thoughts and inspirations that made me want to move out and pursue that a little bit deeper. So we have some people who are very familiar with mindfulness, meditation, being present, and others that are still new. For me, I have a long history. I always joke around. My mom was Buddhist, so you know I'm very familiar with meditation. But my dad was Catholic, so I'm very conversant with guilt <laughs> and societal pressure. And for some people, meditation, mindfulness, seems a little bit either hokey and or tied to a religion, even though a lot of people will see meditation as not a religion. Can mindfulness be practiced in a secular way or do you have to be Buddhist? Do you have to be X, Y, and Z? Yeah, fortunately, there's a lot of research on mindfulness that shows that if you practice it in a secular way, you can achieve a level of peace and tranquility, get rid of your stress and anxiety. So I like- So it's not a religion. It's not like religious at all. It is, mindfulness is coming from Hinduism and Buddhism, right? That's the source of all meditation practices, right? That's where it's all coming from. And most of those folks earlier on practiced it with a spiritual purpose in mind, either connecting with oneself, connecting with the universe, connecting with the divine. That's where the roots are coming from. However, There's been research showing that even if someone doesn't get into all of those other rituals and just practices the techniques on their own, that they experience physical, mental, and emotional benefit. And you don't have to worship a deity. You don't have to bow down. You don't have to do any of the other rituals that are involved with the mindfulness practice, and you still get benefited. And just to make it accessible, I when we talk about mindfulness, I think it's important to talk a little bit about the mind. And I like to compare the mind to one of these, right? A smart device. And just like in our smart device, when we have too many apps open, it slows down and it also drains the battery, right? So when we have a lot of- That's the best analogy. (laughs) (laughs) I'm going to ask everyone a question. How many apps do you think are open in your mind right now? If Now, mindfulness is really about, and I'm just trying to make it accessible. If we can close out the apps up here and only keep open the ones we need, don't you think we'd be much more productive? We'd be much more focused. We'd be able to get more done. Here's another analogy. If there's traffic on the freeways or the highways, you're not making much progress. You clear out the traffic jam, you get to your destination faster. That's what we're doing with mindfulness. So that's why I want to break it out of the whole religion, spirituality thing. Again, if you want to practice it that way, great. And so if you declutter and get rid of the traffic jam up here, which is what mindfulness does, you will get to your destination faster. Your conversations with people will be more focused. Your relationships will be deeper. You'll be more empathetic. You'll be able to hear people more, hear them and to understand. So everything about us becomes more present and focused. So when we're trying to become more present and focused, that has nothing to do with spirituality or religion. It just means being a more mindful, more present, more focused, being more mindful person. So yes, it can be practiced in a very secular way because mindfulness, in, there's a, there was a nice article in Forbes that said mindfulness makes you more productive. So if you close out the apps you don't need, naturally you'll be more productive with the ones that you do. There was an article in the Harvard Business Review that said mindfulness can improve your emotional intelligence, especially during the pandemic where we can't see each other so much. We really need more emotional intelligence, being able to understand other people's perspective. So yes, the, to answer your question, We can practice it in a secular way. And if we want to practice it in a spiritual way to go within and discover ourselves and discover our relationship with the divine, we can go in either direction. That is probably one of the most powerful analogies I've seen in terms of the tabs, because I just think about my computer, like I will have a hundred tabs open. I'm like, okay, I'll get that, get to that. And then you keep on opening and you never go back to the original tab. And I think about how many of us live that kind of life. And I think about 
technology now. Like my daughter seven and she will be reading, she'll be on her iPad, but she'll also be playing a video game. So she'll have two screens, but she'll also want to read. So she has a book on the side and maybe the TV's on. And we live in a, a society where we're always on. And yeah. it's that pause or that presentness that is so important. It's almost rebooting ourselves. We have a comment from Nina, many different types of focused awareness practices and open awareness focused practices are very com common mindfulness techniques and are not necessarily spiritual in nature. Thank you, Nina. Earlier, I spoke about the growing alarm of like loneliness, especially in the States. We have a global audience here calling in from Australia, the UK, Asia, etc. Can mindfulness help us overcome loneliness? So mindfulness really means getting in touch with ourselves and getting in touch with our behaviors. And so if we can get more into the present moment and look at our own situation and our own behavior, like for example, what, is it, what am I referring to? I'm going, I'm having lunch with a friend and I keep looking at this. Now that is going to distance me from that friend, right? Just like, I was listening to this one short talk by Simon Sinek. He said that if I'm talking to you or a room full of people and I'm holding this in my hand, do you feel like the most important person? No, because this becomes the most important person. Or I'm having lunch with my friend and this is sitting on the table and there's a notification. And while I'm talking to my friend, I decide to take a look. So that means I'm not fully present with my friend. That means that, that thing is distracting me from my friend. And now my friend can feel that. Now, what if they're, we're having an important, delicate conversation and I keep doing that because I'm so addicted to my phone? Am I able to put this away and really give my full attention to my friend? So I think a lot of our loneliness is to some degree is self-induced because we're not fully present with the people in our lives because we want to do so many other things. It's hard. We've seen it. And I'm, I have to say that I'm also guilty of it. You could be with somebody that you care for, your spouse or someone walking in the park, and each one's looking at their phone while sitting on the park bench. And you're in the park. And like I said, I'm also guilty of that. And I was like, oh my gosh, here I am doing the same thing that I thought was not such a good idea. And you're, you're sitting with someone that you care deeply about, and you're on your phone, and they're on their phone. And it's what's the meaning of us being here? Can't we just be here, hold hands and just talk and quietly look at the sky or look at look people watch or whatever we're doing? Can we just do that and not look at this? So I think the way mindfulness can help us is as we become more present and aware of how we're behaving. I think that as we start giving more attention to individuals, so as much as social media and connects us, it also disconnects us. It's doing both at an extreme level, which is interesting. Like you talk to your family anytime real quickly now, anywhere in the world. But then we can't talk with our friends who are right next to us because we're all busy on our phones. So I think it's what really helping us raise our self-awareness so that we can be more present in our relationships. Nowadays, you call a friend, they won't even answer the phone. They'll just text you back. It's like people don't answer calls anymore. It's all about texting you back or messaging you back. So we're losing our personalism. And, and I think that mindfulness can help us be more present with the people in our lives, which is the way to solve the problem of loneliness to some degree or another. Is mindfulness and meditation the same thing? And if not, what if you could dig deeper into what each of them looks like, what does it mean? So meditation is the actual practice where you close your eyes and you do breathing exercises, focusing exercises, or you chant certain mantras like OM or other mantras, right? So that is called meditation when you're actually doing a practice. It's like when you're doing a push up, then you're not doing a pull up, that's a push up. It's different from a pull up. So meditation is an exercise for the mind where you close your eyes, you go inward, and there's dozens of types of meditations. Mindfulness is being in touch, in the, being in the present moment and being in touch with your thoughts and emotions. And again, so mindfulness can be implemented when we eat. When I eat, am I focusing on my food? Am I enjoying the food? 
When I'm having a conversation, am I present with that person? That's also mindfulness. When I'm working, am I able to focus? When my colleagues are talking, am I able to listen to them to understand them? Or am I listening just to respond to them? So mindfulness can be practiced in almost every sphere of our life. It's becoming more self-aware of ourselves. How am I doing things and what do I need to change to be more present and not always live a distracted life? Meditation is the specific practice of breathing and focusing or chanting exercises that we do to help us with our mindfulness practice or mindfulness living. I hope that was helpful. No, that was very helpful. I think it's going to help a lot of folks who are watching this, who are new to this. And so am I oversimplifying this by saying that mindfulness is focusing on one thing at the present moment? It's focusing on one thing at the present moment and also it's being in touch with ourselves. That's really important. Am I angry right now? Why am I angry? Am I sad? Why am I sad? Being aware of that and not just saying, oh, I'm sad right now. So let me just do this to get rid of that sadness. No, why am I sad? Well, how can I get rid of this sadness? Or maybe I don't need to get rid of it right now. It's okay to sit with it for a while and not distract myself. Let my body go through it. Otherwise, as opposed yeah. to just pushing it down somewhere and then it shows up all at once. Yeah. I think we're in a society that tries to numb our emotions in a lot of ways, whether it's we numb it with food, we numb it with work, we numb it with technology or the internet. And it's hard for us to really be mindful of how we feel, right? Until we explode out of stress or burnout. So how could the folks, the laymen, non-monks, folks who are on this call, practice mindfulness? What's a way to start? You mentioned being mindful in how you walk, how you eat. How could I just start the practice of mindfulness? One thing is a lot of times when we talk about mind, practicing mindfulness, people get overwhelmed because they think they have to do it for 30 minutes, an hour, 20 minutes at a time that, you know, and I know that's a little overwhelming for most people to maintain that on a sustainable level. I would say when a simple practice that one can start with is instead of doing for too long at a time, I said, do it for one to two minutes, a few times a day. Something easy, digestible, accessible, and that doesn't create a mental block. So you wake up in the morning, don't let this be the first thing you reach for. Just lay there, take 10 deep breaths. Be grateful that you're waking up and now you have a day ahead of you. No need to go to this right away. You can ask yourself, do I really need to grab that? No, I don't. So then let me go ahead and take a few deep breaths. And right before you go into a meeting with colleagues, why not take 30 seconds and take a few deep breaths and just feel grateful and then begin that meeting. And what can you do? Again, it's breathe in such a way that you fill up your lungs completely. And when you exhale, exhale thoroughly and completely. So that's the kind of breathing I'm talking about because we, the kind of breath we take most of the time is super shallow. It's almost like we're just getting by. <laughs> we got enough to get by. But really, yeah. when we take breaths, research even shows that can help lower stress, anxiety, and even regulate our blood pressure. So my point is, why not de-stress ourselves throughout the day by taking one minute every hour, every couple of hours, and just take some deep breaths. And when you're feeling negative or down, take a moment to think of a few things in your life that you're grateful for. And just take a moment to appreciate that gratitude is such a powerful mindset shifter. It can shift our mindset so quickly from the negative to the positive. So these are simple ways. And you don't have to sit cross-legged. You don't have to sit in a mountain or at the beach. You could do it in your office. You could do it at your home. Just take a moment and get in touch with yourself. If you get an angry email and now you're ready to respond, Take a few deep breaths. Say, I'm not going to respond to this right now because I'm not a subject. I'm not objective anymore. And I'm going to say something I'm going to regret. So I'm going to take, and that's mindfulness. Like you, because you recognize you're angry, you recognize you're not in a good space, and you have the ability to step back and say, I'm going to come back in a little while and address this. It's just being think about, aware. think about how much violence, wars, confrontation we would avoid if people just took that pause. That, that's it's so everything. powerful, the pause and really yeah. tuning into your emotions. 
and it also reminds me, I would go to the Buddhist temple with my mother. And I remember they would have us cutting the vegetables during certain days. And I remember the monk would say meditation is part of meditation is being present in cutting your food. And so I always took that with me, like when you're eating, when you're doing something, being present, because how many of us are talking to our kids or we're cooking in the kitchen and we're thinking about work and all these other things, but just that simple act of thinking about washing your hands and how the water feels on your hands is mindfulness. When you're cutting your vegetables and you're eating and you're, you're savoring the food, that's mindfulness. So we have a question from Yosra Fandi. Yosra, so Yosra has a great question. How can mindfulness, especially if it's chronic, how does it help you stay productive and focused? Have you had a similar experience where mindfulness has helped you? Mindfulness has helped me in so many ways in terms of pain and like chronic, I have not had that experience, but I do know that when I've been to the dentist and it was a painful experience, I started doing breathing exercises and actually the whole thing was so much easier to go through. I'm like, okay, I got to practice what I teach now. And then it was a little unpleasant, a deeper level of cleaning than I thought it would be. And then I was like, okay, I just started to take deep breaths. I'm just, I'm just focusing on my breath. And it also, it's amazing is it distracts the mind. It gives the mind something else to focus on. Sometimes you see like a kid, they're crying, you give them something and it stops. There wasn't any real pain. It was just some other emotion that they weren't able to express. And so when our mind is given something other than the pain to focus on, it will actually focus on that. And so I'm not saying that it's going to fix the chronic pain. We still need to take our, do our physical therapy or medicine, whatever things, treatments we're taking, we probably need to continue that. But if we can focus our mind on just the breath, it's amazing what the breath can accomplish. The mind, give it something productive to do, and then it doesn't think about that. And I think we've all experienced that in different times when you're all of a sudden get like really great news, even if you have a lot of pain, then all of a sudden, oh my gosh, yeah, great. And then you go back to the pain, like, oh, it's amazing how powerful the mind is and how we can turn it to other things, turn it away from pain. And that's why I know a lot of the Eastern traditions say walk the middle path, meaning don't get too excited or too sad just stay in the middle and stay focused in the middle as much as you can. So at least you can try the breathing and I hope that helps. No, I think it's really helpful. And actually it's funny that you mentioned breathing because my daughter here, Morgan, years ago the, at the beginning of the pandemic, I was going through some emotional stress, stresses. And my daughter taught me this five finger exercise. Morgan, do you want to show? So she put it up. I was like literally in a huge depression and she was like mommy breathe mommy breathe and she put five fingers and you basically breathe in breathe out breathe in breathe out breathe in breathe out and she would do that for her five fingers thanks morgan but the power of breath right and the wisdom of children i think i was hyperventilating because i was like just going through a lot and she was just like mommy breathe Last question, because I know Pandit has to go. It's a great question. Chris Jill's question is, what are three to five easy steps to incorporate mindfulness into the process of overcoming our own personal biases so we can bridge and deepen our connection to others? Oh, that's a good question, Crystal. Yeah. So what are three to five steps to incorporate mindfulness in the process of recognizing our unconscious biases? I think that as we do take time out for ourselves and do these breathing exercises, and then we try really just go deeper within and ask ourselves, what kind of unbunched biases do I have? And when they come up, really acknowledging them and even writing them down and maybe asking ourselves, why are they there? Why am I, why do I have this unconscious bias towards, I don't know, this kind of person or this kind of person, or just trying to go deeper in where it's coming from. And that helps a lot. Oh yeah. In my childhood, my parents used to say this and this, and because of that, it got lodged into my head. So it's just really powerful to unpack. But again, we need time for ourselves to be able to discover that if we keep ourselves constantly busy, then it's going to be hard for those ideas to percolate up. So I think just taking that time for ourselves. So Len, can I put a couple of links in here for people if they want sure, to follow Sure, yes, me? definitely. Send it and then I'll also cut and paste into the different live streams. Okay. Oh.
how can you help you guys follow Pandit on LinkedIn? Also his Instagram right there. For the folks who are watching it on the live stream, I'm going to post that. As we close up, because Pandit has to leave, un if you guys can, for the folks who are in the live Zoom audience, can you please unmute yourself and turn on your videos? Because Pandit deserves a round of applause. Please turn on your videos and unmute yourself. And let's give a round of applause for Pandit. Woohoo! Thank, Thank you, you so, so much, much Pandit. That was such a powerful conversation and I know it's going to help the folks, the thousands of folks who are going to be watching this on all the live stream and on LinkedIn and in this live Zoom audience. I know I'm going to be practicing mindfulness much more after this call. Thank you, Pandit. Thank you everyone Thank for making you. it. Thank you. Thanks everyone.